Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Cantor. I'm Chief Risk Officer, Chief Credit Officer at Moody's Investor Service, and I'm joined by a distinguished panel to discuss trash or treasure, finding value in distressed debt investing. With me is Lauren Scottleap from Fundamental Advisors, Chris Pacillo from Solus Alternative Asset Management, Brian Reynolds from Chatham Capital, and Steve Schwartz from Shapiro. Uh, Shapiro. Sorry, Steve <laughs> Shapiro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, Golden, gr 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 Golden Tree, <laughs> Green Tree, Golden Tree. I got it right. Shapiro from Golden Tree. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're going to start. Everyone's going to give a brief introduction to their fund and uh, the strategy, and then we're going to start over here with Lawrence. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, nice to see some uh, so many familiar faces uh, here this morning. Uh, it's a terrific. Uh, uh, conference that the Milken Institute puts together, and nice to see all, all uh, friends of, of ours here. Um, fundamental focuses on municipal uh, alternative investing, so we're looking for total return uh, and total value. Uh, our investment vehicles are structured as both private equity uh, and hedge fund format vehicles. Uh, we're now uh, eight years in business uh, and have you know, spanned the range of investing uh, in municipals, doing nearly everything uh, other than um, stable uh, yield uh, uh, in high-grade securities. Uh, look forward to spending the morning with you. Okay, um, my name is Chris Pacillo, um, CEO and uh, CIO of Solus Alternative Asset Management. Solus is a uh, primarily distressed investor. Uh, we have several fund vehicles that total a little over six billion, um, and again, you know, we focus uh, across the entire capital structure, but for the most part on uh, stress and distressed opportunities. And uh, I'm Brian Reynolds with uh, the founder of Chatham Capital, and uh, we have a fund. We're in our fourth fund. We have a billion under management, and we do leverage lending. We do first lien and second lien, mostly for LBOs. Hi, Stephen Shapiro with Golden Tree. Uh, Golden Tree is a 15-year-old uh, asset management firm. We're currently managing around 23 billion in assets. We're in all parts of corporate credit and leverage finance, uh, high yield bond, levered loans, uh, distressed and structured credit. We have offices in New York and London and uh, are 100% employee owned. Thank you. So uh, there's not that much distressed credit around these days it's where we are in the cycle. But of course, one sector that's quite large and on many people's minds is the energy industry, which represents about 15% of the high yield index. And I think at the year end, about 5% of, of that sector was trading at distressed values. Um, Chris, I know you spent a lot of time looking at the industry. Can you share us your insights? Sure. Uh, we know that we had a, a pretty significant trade down in a lot of the high yield bonds in the sector uh, in, uh, late last year and the beginning of this year. It has rallied since then. Um, one of the one of the things that we're seeing is really more liquidity driven, you know, price sensitivity. You know, all, kind of all buyers or all sellers. And you know, when we look at investments, um, you know, for for us, it's the valuation that makes the most um, the largest part of the investment decision. And currently, and I would say this is across the capital structure, both in, in debt and equity of energy-related companies, the valuations are based on a forward uh, oil price that's, that's just too high, you know, to really to justify those valuations. And I think that there will be additional um, volatility in oil prices, and I think it could be self-fulfilling from the amount of capital that's going to be you know, financed, um, really more f first lean, type paper that's above the current capital structure, you know, to, to allow the drilling to continue. And I think that will actually create a bigger um, oversupply, for, especially in the U.S. in the future. And I think that, you know, that's, that's the time that we would, you know, most likely get involved. Right now, it's, it's a little too soon. Too soon. Brian, are you also? Yeah, so we're, um, you know, if you look at the U.S. rig count, there's a slide on it if you want to pull it up, um, and uh, oil prices. Um, you can see that the uh, the rig count is down from 2000 in 2011 to uh, under 700. It was reported today, and um, so w we have excess production now um, and excess supply, but that will that will dwindle over time. 
and um, you know, so we have to work through this excess production that we have now. Um, but oil prices probably going to shift basically not on U.S. production because our rigs are down so low, but you know, Libya, Russia, Iran, and Iraq, and what happens there and how much they can uh, deliver to the market. So it's going to be a uh, crapshoot over the next next uh, year or so. I'll turn to Steve. And just uh, maybe Steve or Lawrence, you might want to comment on uh, whatever you particularly interested in, but also uh, the extent to which capital is getting mobilized to um, to address the distress in this industry. Is it is it typical of what we've seen in the past? Is it unusual? Is it are we in? A, is it particular to where we are in the cycle? If we'd been in a different part of the cycle, would would the capital mobilization process been uh, less effective? Sure, so uh, our, our view is, uh, I think in, in accordance with some of what we've heard already, is we're, we're probably early in, into the trade. Um, some of the supply demand dynamics don't look good for, for oil and gas uh, still. We view, uh, we really view oil and gas as part of a larger uh, commodity complex, which is about 20% of the, of the market. And there are just other parts of commodities that we think are more attractive. So there are things in shipping, there are some ideas in coal, certain metals that we find more, uh, more attractive opportuni opportunities right now than, than we do with oil and gas. And it's interesting, in oil and gas, it's very situational. And one of the things that's striking is it seems that uh, you're getting better risk reward in the equities in some cases than in the debt because the debt appears to be pricing in some recoveries in the commodity that I don't think the equities are. So in some cases you could have potential for a double or more in a stock and you might be only, only up 10 or 15 points in the debt security, either secured debt or, or a bond, if things work out. And the bet is not all that different because the debt portion seems to be pricing in a, a recovery that the stocks aren't. So it's, a, it's interesting where you're getting the best risk adjusted spread in the capital structure. In terms of capital being raised against the opportunity, look, it, it, you have a lot of people out there with dedicated energy funds now. I think some will do well and, and many won't. We think it's early in the, uh, in the trade. Uh, and um, look, anytime, you know, for a while it was banks in Europe are going to be, you know, regurgitating hundreds of millions of dollars of, or billions of dollars of, of uh, terrific corporate loans at 70 cents on the dollar, and a lot of capital was raised. The problem is there's a dearth of really good ideas and large cap distress right now, so anytime there is something in a large sector that's actionable, you're going to have a lot of capital raised against it. Um, not all of it's going to work, clearly. Right. Lawrence, uh, any of this uh, distress hitting the public finance sector related to You know, we saw, we saw uh, uh, hints of it uh, to pick up on what Stephen was mentioning a moment ago. We, we have seen that phenomena uh, where you have um, managers uh, specializing investment vehicles for a particular opportunity du jour. Uh, we have uh, at fundamental ample capital in different investment vehicles that can address itself to any of these opportunities as they may arise. Uh, we did see uh, the early indis indications of uh, Alaska or Oklahoma uh, debt trading off uh, when energy crisis was the headline on every newspaper every morning. Um, I would, I would again uh, agree with something, Stephen. It's early. Uh, we do not think that, particularly municipal finance, uh, will be uh, so moved by the price of any particular commodity uh, that we find that at this moment to be a very investable theme. It's not that we're ignoring it. It's that I believe it is early. Okay, so with respect to trash or treasure, it sounds uh, it's not treasure at this point uh, for the for our panel for the most part. Uh, maybe we'll 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 start talking about treasure right now. And if Lawrence, if you could give us uh, some of the sectors that you think are are, are poised to do do well right now and why. Uh, well, I, I think we're a little bit different than some of my colleagues here on the panel. We're very focused on assets that touch communities and have public purposes. Uh, in that vein. We are uh, constantly focused on housing, healthcare, infrastructure. Uh, these are operating business and then underlying assets, sometimes that involve real estate, that have uh, lasting places and connectivity uh, to a community. Uh, we are 
very bullish on the notion that communities will go through an evolution where the services that they deliver to uh, their constituents will be uh, reframed. And that will allow room for those of us with private capital to address ourselves to public needs, community needs, and do so in an exciting way that can produce value for our investors and value for, for the communities. And so in that vein, Richard, I would point to uh, affordable housing. I would point to needs-based senior care. These are areas that we are very focused on uh, with our investment, investable capital and our investment team's uh, resources. Thanks. Chris, if you have similar gems? So for us, really, you know, we kind of focus more on themes in our portfolio. And uh, you know, one of the themes that we've been working on for a number of years is in the cellular phone spectrum. Right. And we, you know, we have a number of assets in the portfolio now where the companies basically own spectrum. And we're working you know, with the companies, with the FCC, in creating something that's actually more valuable than, than what we currently have. And we, uh, we also participated through, with, through one of our companies in a recent Spectrum auction that took place. Um, the FCC auctioned you know, the Spectrum <coughs> off of, you know, about four or five weeks ago. And the opportunity there is really interesting because when you, when you look at the cost for, a, for a, a wireless carrier to build a network, the, the actual cost of the Spectrum is a very small part of it. It's you know, going from you know, 2G to 3G to 4G. You know, that rebuilding is really the, the bulk of the cost. So if you have the nationwide spectrum in large enough bandwidth and you, you, know, you offer your customers you know, the connectivity that they want, you, know, you keep your customers or you get customers from those networks that can't provide it. And you know, we think you know, given everything that's going on now you know, with you know, mobile da data and you know, streaming of, of video, it's, uh, it's going to be bigger and bigger opportunity you know, for the market. So that's an area that we're very much focused on. Thanks. I mean, it's, it's fascinating for me to be a part of this panel just to give everyone a sense of, I don't know where you all stand in the investment spectrum, but I focus uh, in corporates, high, high yield, investment grade, but not in distress. And, and I, I think the people on this panel and similar investors uh, undertake a depth of analysis for special situations that kind of create uh, a, a, a valuation service for the rest of the edifice of fixed income to stand on top of and, and, and use. And so I'm learning a lot and talk we've talked offline as well about these special situations uh, these investors are, are involved in and the amount of research they do and, uh, and, and the specialty knowledge that they is very different from someone who's just taking a view on the overall market, which uh, is, is um, you know, you can agree or disagree with, but so let's keep hearing some more of these special ideas. Sure, Brian. sure. I think you know we we uh, we also have some wireless resellers, and we definitely like that sector also. Um, and then uh, we look at uh, places in the distressed area where things are disrupted and uh, regulations are coming in. So we, you know, things like the payday lending business. There's uh, companies in there that have already adopted. The legislation and are way ahead of the legislation, you know, like like Ace, Ace and CNG, and they've restructured their companies already, and so they're trading at 70 cents, and um, you know it's a nice play to get in at 70 cents on something that's tr that's uh, got a debt to EBITDA of five times, and still very good value and 100 cent value, so it's a great place to to make some money uh, there. Um, BDCs are same thing; they've they've traded down. On some of the oil exposure, uh, some of the some of the names traded down, but then the rest of the industry traded down. So, the industry was trading at 105, um, and today it's trading at 97. So it's under book value. So they can't raise any money, but the dividend yields average 9.7 percent in the whole sector. And that's an, in these days, uh, what we heard this morning. It's a pretty good. That's a pretty good return. So those are those are a few sectors that uh, we look at. Right, and Steve. Sure, I think uh, we're not in a part of the distressed market where there's broad themes across lots of different industries. I think we're going to be getting there in the next 12 or 24 months. But right now, most of the opportunities we're seeing are idiosyncratic, one-off, very eclectic. Um, where you know whether it's a liquidation like the GM units, uh, there are parts of Puerto Rico that we find very interesting. We've actually we continue to see good value in the yellow page directories sector, believe it or not, which. You know, I think we're all seeing the ice cube melts a lot slower than 
the worst doomsday predictions and these businesses throw off a lot of cash and are transitioning from print to digital. So there's, you know, there's really, um, I wouldn't say there's, there's broad uh, themes um, right now, but, it, but there are uh, sort of middle market eclectic opportunities out there that, that we're taking advantage of. Right. Well, let's let you mention Puerto Rico. Let's let's spend a little time on Puerto Rico. Seventy billion dollars of debt. Uh, it's uh, has many types of debt. Uh, it has geo bonds. It has the government development bank. It has public corporations. There's even convention revenue backed bonds. Uh, you name it. It is all, the whole menu of, of bonds to choose from. Clearly, there's distress. Uh, there's been interest in the U.S. Congress of, of, of making Chapter 9 available to pu public entities in Puerto Rico for filing. There's been interest in the Puerto Rican legislation to expand the opportunity to negotiate with in, in investors. And, uh, and of course, they're currently engaged uh, with negotiations uh, at, the, at the public utility, the electric utility uh, right now. So a lot going on in Puerto Rico very complex situation. Uh, Lawrence, I know, has been spending a lot of time on it. Maybe share your insights on, on you know, what, what's going to happen, but also what is it as a um, distressed investor you need to do in a situation like Puerto Rico, which may be different from uh, in your research for, for and, and what in preparation compared to a municipal bank bankruptcy or, or a corporate bankruptcy, of course. Yeah, uh, certainly lots going on. It's been uh, an area of uh, significant focus, uh, though I will point out not exclusive for us. We have uh, uh, plenty to do away from Puerto Rico, but on the subject of Puerto Rico, um, your first question is uh, sort of what's going to happen. It's our strongly held view that this can and should be resolved and that it is resolvable. Uh, nothing would be better than a cohesive, um, intelligent, thoughtful way of looking at these diverse credits, uh, some of which you mentioned, uh, and in a way that um, allows the United States and the development uh, of Title 11, in this case Chapter 9, and, and, and we'll see if Congress uh, does take our suggestion uh, to allow Chapter 9 to apply in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Um, but we, we, we believe a cohesive approach to restructuring this complex maze uh, will leave Puerto Rico in a better place and the capital, the municipal markets for sure in a better place. The opposite is worth mentioning. Um, in the summertime you saw that, uh, of last year, you saw an effort that ultimately led to the Puerto Rico Re Recovery Act that was recently struck down um, that left a vacuum, meaning that there is no rubric right now for the restructuring of the various credits. Uh, and so when I say the opposite, I mean if we find that different creditors of different capital structures go through different channels in an effort to gain advantage over, over one another uh, in something uh, that looks chaotic, that would be the worst of all circumstances uh, in our view. Um, there's much more to talk about here. Uh, for us, we see at least three things that we can do. That is, the $70 billion cap stack certainly presents investable themes. Government services, the delivery of housing, health care, and other services is investable for us. And then you have distressed assets as well. So we're very active in the space. Uh, happy to continue or, or uh, okay. allow for others. Yeah, well, I know we have a couple investors who have focused on narrow pieces of that capital stack. I think, stack. I think Chris has sure. for one. You know, I think the one, the one thing about, about Puerto Rico, and, and Lawrence mentioned Chapter 9 and, and what you know, the, the Recovery Act that they tried to put forth, you know, um, you know, last summer, I think the, the one thing you have to remember is that it's not, it's not a Chapter 11 process, so it's not going to work like the United States, you know, typical corporate bankruptcies. It's going to work more like the municipal bankruptcies, which is very, very different. And, you know, the one point that, that Lawrence made, which I think is, you know, worth, is worth mentioning again, is that the creditors and the, and the borrowers, and let's take PREPA as an example, need to work together. And the Recovery Act, what it effectively did was put the burden of the problem specifically onto certain of the entities like PREPA um, and took it off other entities. 
And you, you, you just can't do that if you're going to work it out. And, and one of the, the things in Chapter 9 is that there has to be, in order to file for Chapter 9, there has to be a concerted effort made you know, between creditors and, and the issuer to have a solution. And you actually have to have a plan you know, in order to, to even go into Chapter 9. So I think um, certain of the, of the entities will be able to put a plan together. And it's really going to be you know, how rational the country or the uh, territory is going to be with regard to you know, treating all the different entities. And you know, that, the, the, the fact of the matter is if PREPA were a corporate bankruptcy, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. There's, there's, there's plenty of assets there. there are, you know, the, the rate structure is actually really close to working. But they're, they're just taking that much more than they're supposed to contractually in terms of you know, giving the lower rates to the people in, in Puerto Rico. So if they can adjust that, even to make it what the indentures actually say, you have a, you know, a successful you know, restructuring in PREPA. Right. right. And Steve, I think you all. Yeah, I, just, I, I would echo some of what was said. You look at a situation like Greece, and there's, there's going to have to be a huge IMF you know, bailout coming in ahead of the bonds. And you don't really know what that's going to look like. But there's you know, significant, um, you know, significant downside that's sort of unquantifiable right now. And contrast that to Puerto Rico, where it is, it is workable. I mean, there's going to be a lot of debate about how to split up the value and what has to be done. But this is a fixable situation, we think, which means that there are parts of the complex that, uh, and you know, we, we, we think PREP is interesting. We, we particularly like the Cofina bonds which are uh, backed by sales tax. And um, you know, it's clearly going to be a complicated process, but uh, it does seem like a fixable problem. And that presents in investment opportunities. And within Cofina, there are wrapped bonds and unwrapped bonds. And we like each for different reasons. But um, you know, I would contrast it to some of the other, particularly you look like uh, in Argentina or Greece, which, which just seem tougher from an analytical point of view. Uh, you spend a lot of time in Argentina and still throw up your hands as to what's going to happen at the end of the day. It does seem like Puerto Rico's got problems that can be addressed. Right. Well, we'll certainly learn a lot. It's going to be uh, quite a ride, I think. Uh, the let municipal. Me ask, let me ask sure. you. See if, see if, if uh, I was curious. You know, they have this new section 2022 down there, and um, you guys could answer this. Is that going to have any effect on the economy down there, or is there so few people taking advantage of that tax benefit of, you know, essentially four percent, zero to four percent taxes in Puerto Rico? Um, you know, is that going to have any effect on the economy down there, or is it just too too few people that are going to affect the economy? And uh, you know, think, Lawrence and Chris, you may want to comment. I think on that. the the question raises uh, the larger question, which is, what is the case for growth for Puerto Rico? Um, we view this as having a multifaceted dynamic, meaning that. So tax incentives to entice businesses or wealthy individuals to move down uh, and help spawn economic activity is terrific. Um, reinvesting in the medical and life sciences community where there is a history uh, of excellence there in, in San Juan, particularly throughout the island, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, is terrific. Industrial uh, investment. Th these are all pieces of the puzzle. I would say about PREPA, uh, to pick up on your comments, Chris, Yes, I hear that. One of the issues there is that you have antiquated technology, you have a bureaucracy, you have uh, issues that are manageable but will require some careful hand-holding and facilitation in order to, to, to bring it, uh, if, if I may say so, to the modern world. Uh, there's some a antiquated practices there. Advancing a tax uh, incentive in order to entice folks to transact and to relocate and to spawn businesses there are going to excite exactly these kinds of conversations. What can we do well? Puerto Rico has a tie to the DR. The DR has a trade negotiation pact with the EU. You can create a, 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 an ecosystem there that, that lends itself to this case for growth. This is the dialogue that I think that many of Puerto Rico's public officials really want to move the conversation into. They want to contain and address today's fiscal crisis. And this liquidity package will give, give folks a runway uh, to deal with uh, a renegotiation of certain, we think, of the government-owned uh, government cor corporations and then 
clear the way for, to discuss the case for growth on the island? Well, I think the big issue from my perspective is will this be dealt with piecemeal or, or will there be a consolidated uh, solution attempted? Uh, you know, some of the credits uh, have historically been viewed as, as having dedicated revenue streams that will perhaps raise their, their uh, credit quality. Uh, Steve mentioned COFINA, which is, you know, was the most recent set of debt issued in, over the last few years with a dedicated sales tax. Um, you know, secured type uh, revenue rated, rated higher initially by the rating agencies and priced ch more cheaply uh, with a lower yield by the market. Uh, we've since come, to, come down to view it as very similar in risk to the GO bonds, um, but it's still unclear what will actually, what will happen there. There's been talk of folding it into a consolidated settlement. Uh, with respect to other, you know, Detroit is the most recent uh, bankruptcy. Um, the various priorities of claim and traditions in the muni market were largely observed, I think, in that, in that settlement, uh, although pensions were treated more favorably uh, than, than you would have expected from the, the legal uh, requirements. But uh, it's, it's really unclear to me with respect to Puerto Rico. I mean, are, are, are people confident that uh, priorities of claim are going to be honored or, or just might be a consolidated settlement where it's, it's all, you know, well, I think it's it's 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, we should start with the the price, which you know it, it it's not as if you're paying a big premium mm -hmm. for for this. And you know there are some arguments to, to keep it. Um, the fact that it is backed by the the, the tax, and mm -hmm. if they want to be a credible issuer going forward, do they respect certain uh, structures? Um, but but I think pricing has a lot to do with it. Uh, it doesn't seem like you're paying a big premium. And then as I said, there are some bonds that are wrapped by insurance and, and others that aren't and we think if you are in a bond if, if they have to restructure and you're in a bond that's not wrapped we think it's cheap relative to the recovery we see achieving in an unwrapped piece of paper and the wrapped piece of paper you're now facing an insurer who where we think this trades cheap to uh, long dated uh, CDS on the insurers so we, we there's, right. there's a very different thesis on each part of the investment but but um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think at 50 cents on the dollar, there's, there's, uh, there's good protection built in. And Richard, I think to, to address you know, the, the question about you know, how it's gonna go down, I think the, the, the one thing which you know, people look at you know, the different assets in, and say, well, this is better because this is sales tax, or this is not as good because this is backed by power, power plant revenue. The problem is, is that they're not adhering to the, the indenture in PREPA. And they're, the way that the waterfall is, is currently structured in the indenture is not what's happening. So I don't know what's, not, what's to stop them from saying, you know what, now that we have the bonds, let's just cut the sales tax, forget it. Right. You know, and and that's, I think that's the inherent issue with, with dealing with them is they're just not behaving irrationally. And you know, to Steve's point, I think you, you can't be a credible future issuer unless you start adhering to what the indenture says. And I think they, they need to do that. And I think they need to stop you know, stealing from, you know, one pocket to put it in another. Right. You know, PREPA has an enormous number of employees that they don't need. And, the, you know, but they're, I don't know, I guess the equivalent of union jobs. And, you know, so they're employing a lot of people on the island. Um, the way that the municipalities pay for their power is, is not the way the indenture, you know, sets it up. You know, so when you start to move one lever, it has an impact on other, other things and it, and it creates like a domino effect. Right. So it does really need to be a holistic solution when you kind of take all the, the individual pieces apart. And you know, as far as the infrastructure is concerned, th there's a very easy way you know, to you know, actually build new power plants all within the current structure of the indenture. And you know, the, you know, the capital has been offered by the, by the bondholder group to do that. You know, so they need to move out of coal and into natural gas. And, you know, but you can't look at it, just that individual situation because it does create a domino effect in the, in the overall structure. Okay. Well, I don't want to be such a downer, but <laughs> we'd, I did want to give people an opportunity if they had any, any sectors they really were trying to avoid. I, if they had an opportunity to short, they would. Is there, is there any, any particular, Steve? Do you yeah, we mentioned energy. I think yeah. it's, it's just early. We're not necessarily uh, short um, a, a lots of different securities, but it does seem like the supply demand characteristics uh, um, in parts of oil and gas are, are, are still out of whack. I saw Friday the, the high yield energy index touched 8% again. 
Uh, might have even dipped below a little bit. I think its wides were 10 and a half in December. So we've had a, a very strong rally back. And um, as I said <coughs> earlier, I think many of the debt securities are pricing in a rebound in the commodity that we're just not, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I just don't have a lot of reason to think it will. Right. And uh, we, we stay away from the uh, oil sector in general, you know, with all the, the service industries, you know, the rail car, they just announced that, um, you know, that no one wants any of the rail cars that they ordered. There's 11,000 on order, but they're going to have them take them. But in the last, last order was 333. So, um, you know, we stay away from those service sectors, sand and the rest of it. And you know, with the rigs down, um, you know, 70%, there's going to be a lot less oil production here in the U.S. Right. US and it's going to be a problem. Right. Anything else? Just uh, maybe we'll turn to some macro themes then. Um, you know, we've been in a positive uh, market for, for credit for quite a period of time now. Uh, at some point, the credit cycle will turn. Uh, wondering what you know, what are we, what are people looking for to see a significant turn? I mean, yes, uh, interest. You know, when when the Fed starts raising interest rates, there might be a little bit of a, a bump. But is that enough? Uh, or do we need other things to be present to get a significant change in in the credit cycle? Um, maybe we'll start over, with Steve. Sure. Look, our, our view is we are we we believe we're deep into the credit cycle. Uh, certainly, well into the second half, you you're starting to see some of the indicia of that, uh, the underperformance of triple C's is something we watch very carefully. Typically, the market's willing to lend to riskier uh, companies at the margin if they believe the economy's heading up and the credit cycle's heading up. When you start seeing triple C's underperform, as we have for the last six or nine months, I guess, significantly underperform, that's a sign to us that the market believes we're, we're deep into the credit cycle. If you just look at the types of uh, financing that have been done the last few years, more triple C's, more leverage on deals, uh, covenant light, uh, hold co dividends to sponsors, a higher percentage of uh, finance going to M&A rather than, than refinancing. So just generally riskier types of lending that have been happening in the market. I don't think we're at the crazy levels of 07, 06 and 07, but there's clearly been less responsible financing going on, and I think that has to come home to roost at some point, three, four years into a credit cycle. So uh, we think there's a, a very significant uh, distressed opportunity coming our way in the next 12 to 24 months. And interestingly, we think there's a very, a very robust stressed opportunity coming, and stressed to, to us is, 75, 80 cents on the dollar, yielding around 13%. That's a, a very unnatural place for a bond to stay for too long. It's either going to 50 cents on the dollar into distressed hands or it's going to fix its issues and trade back on the curve. We've seen almost $300 billion of high yield debt issued below 6, 6%, call it, in the context of a 2% 10 year, which, which makes sense. But our view is the, the world is getting better, the United States is getting better, and that you know, again, people have been wrong on interest rates for a while, but if you fast forward one year, two years, we believe rates will be higher. So if you're looking at a, at a situation where you could have a three, three and a half, four percent, ten year, much of that 300 billion of paper is going to trade into the 80s just to maintain spread. Now, of that 300 billion, a lot of those companies are going to have normal earnings miss or a regulatory challenge, a technology challenge, and the market decides the risk premium should be 100 or 150 basis points higher. Not a disaster, but that means that bond's now trading into the 70s. So we actually think there's going to be a, a very significant universe of paper for us to look at. And we've historically done very well with, with bonds in this area um, in the 75, 80 cent range, where they actually, you may not be the fulcrum security. There's probably value below you. You have CLOs or, or mutual funds that bought something at par. Something was wrong in their thesis, and they're, they're now selling at 80. And you've got a lot of distressed money waiting for it to get to 50 or 60. There's, there's fewer people looking at the bond at 75, 80 cents on the dollar. And you know, fundamentally, we think we're good credit pickers. And if we get some of those credit stories right, you can get 15 or 20 points of capital gain, plus if it takes a year, five or six points of coupon. So 20 plus points on a 75 cent investment, and you're talking about low to mid 20s type IRR. So I think just the interest rate dynamic will be interesting in that you'll crowd out some of these triple C companies, marginal borrowers that have been coming at eight, eight and a half, nine percent 
or maybe even tighter, they may have to pay 10, 11, 12% for capital. That's just going to exacerbate, in many cases, their free cash flow issues if they have to pay more for interest. So you could have a, a squeezing out of more marginal companies, which will be a, a good distressed opportunity. And then if rates move up over the next two years, you're going to have this dynamic of stressed opportunities. So we think it's a very robust uh, 24 months coming our way in, in distressed and stressed. Brian, are you? And I, th I think um, you know we we see the rates going up too, you know, in the CLO market and the the distress there, rates are going to be going up. And then uh, in our, you know, we're in the lower middle market, less than two hundred million dollar value companies. The BDCs raised uh, twenty five billion dollars in two thousand fourteen, had to deploy that, and they had they lowered the spreads that um, that that market typically had. Now they're they're um, they're trading at uh, below book value, most of them, and they can't raise any money in the public markets. So they, they have no more capital to put to use in the, from the public market debt that they raised. So now we, we're going to see in the middle market that we're going to have an increasing rate also very similar. Well, I'll take the relative bullish position just for sake of argument. Um, that uh, I mean, I, I agree there'll be a, a turn in the cycle, and, and there will be a, a group of credits that you can invest in profitably. So I, I you know, I'm sure that, that what you said uh, makes sense to me. But from a bigger picture point of view, uh, saying we're back to where we were in 2006 in terms of underwriting, that, I mean, that, that's true to a large extent in terms of the type of loans that, that are being made, certainly on a, a leverage basis, I think on a coverage basis. Uh, those borrowers have more coverage than, than they did back then. Of course, we're in the low interest rate environment, so when interest rates rise, they'll be at the similar coverage levels uh, with the exception of some firms, which will be the ones you'll be picking over. Uh, but more generally, I, when I look at the, the last crisis, um, while corporate defaults surged, no question, they reached a very high level, but if you look over the multi-year period, the actual cumulative default experience in the corporate sector was less than in the two previous cycles, and that's in a world in which the, the size and magnitude of the recession was you know, several orders of magnitude higher. So uh, as, as much as those, uh, those, that underwriting was frothy and, and, and did you know, naturally lead to a round of defaults, um, from, a, from a macro perspective, I, I find it hard to imagine that we're heading into a, a period of, of severe uh, corporate defaults even two, three years from now. Um, but interested in my colleagues think. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, you know, I, I agree that the underwriting is terrible and, you know, companies are getting, are getting credit uh, extended to them at inappropriate levels, um, both covenants, pricing, the whole, the whole gamut. But the, the way that the structures are, and they were in 2006, is that they, you know, uh, especially in, in senior secured bank financings, they, there's no teeth. So, Companies don't default unless they have a problem, you know, with, with their with their document. And you know, when you don't have any covenants, you don't default. If you don't have a, a payment that you're missing, you don't default. And because of the you know quantitative easing in this country and all the liquidity that, that ended up flowing into the you know the non-investment grade markets, you know, guys being pushed out in the risk curve, there was plenty of capital to keep the companies alive. And I, I do agree. You know that um, to Steve's point that it will provide you know hugely fertile ground in, at some point in the future, but but that's to me is purely based on inflows and outflows, and right now the CLO market is, I think the highest issuance ever. You know that right you know you know the year to date, and you know I think that investor is probably the the least discerning investor of all investors because they're funding the deal. They got you know. Whatever you know, Moody's and you know S and P requirements for the diversity of their portfolio. That's it. I'm not so sure how much you know credit picking goes on because you know how many companies in every single industry that they need to put in actually even exist. You know, so uh, you know it, to me, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of you know real real good you know research going on because they need to get them funded because the next deal is about to price in, in a month. And, you know, so that's kind of the dynamic. Right. And those are the those are the people who, when there's volatility in the market or bad news, don't know what they own. They're starting to ask questions, and they're the ones selling, just saying, "I want you know, get it out of the portfolio." To 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 respond to what you said earlier, 
two things. You don't really need a default for there to be a good investable distressed opportunity, particularly with Covenant Light. You may not ever get there. That doesn't mean you're not going to have the market trade the security down to a level that presents a good investment opportunity. You have, you know, Weight Watchers term loan is trading at 50 cents on the dollar. They're probably two years away from having to deal with it. But that's still, that, I'm not saying we like it or don't like it at 50 cents, but it's certainly an opportunity uh, to, you know, out in the market. Um, the second thing I'd say is, uh, you, you, we're not predicting anywhere near the default rates that we saw during the Lehman crisis. So we're at roughly 2% now. If you look back <coughs> over the last 30 years, you've had five or six periods like this with, where we're deep into a credit cycle. We think we're probably going back to 4 to 5% uh, default rates. And historically, when you get back to 4 or 5%, you typically have 20% of the loan market and the high yield market trading at traditional distress levels of spreads of, of 1,000 basis mm -hmm. points or more. So if you, if you overlay that on today's market, that's a north of $250 billion opportunity, just if we go back to historical norms of about 4% mm -hmm. defaults. Lawrence, in, in the public sector, I mean, probably not as tied to the corporate credit cycle, um, but maybe some of the similar drivers, uh, but also you have secular concerns uh, about largely pension liabilities uh, in many cases. Places like uh, Chicago, Illinois, New Jersey. Um, you know, at what point do you think, if at all, um, we'll see uh, a, a wider degree of distress in the municipal market? Yeah, good question. I, uh, I would point out that the rule of thumb in our market, the muni market, is about a three point six trillion dollar debt market, and uh, folks like you who observe the market and and give us these. Uh, uh, sizing regimens tell us that about 1% to 2% of the market is distressed uh, or stressed at any particular given uh, period of time. Good markets, bad markets, someplace in between. So that's a 36 to $50 billion uh, a swath of credit out there that, that is trading at distress levels. Uh, with respect to the instance of municipalities in, in distress, uh, there's a distinction there because we have two parts of our market. We have the general obligation part of our market, cities like Chicago, states like Illinois, uh, the city of Detroit, Jefferson County, Alabama, et cetera. Uh, and then you have municipal revenue bonds, which are the asset back structure, which traditionally occupied more of the space of, of the distress in our marketplace. And we, we think for some time will continue to do so. Puerto Rico is someplace on the fence, has, has different types of uh, credits. Um, I want to come back to something Steve was saying earlier. I thought his comments were, were interesting in that there's a dichotomy there, right? Uh, we're all agreeing. Uh, lenders are lending with covenant light type conditions, priced cheaply. Uh, they may, Chris, I think, has, has an interesting point. They may indeed have put structures in place that mask or delay the pain that borrowers are, uh, are, are facing. We have a corollary in the municipal industry where we have debt service reserve funds and these <coughs> other ways of covering uh, weakness at the credit level. On the other hand, the picture we're looking at uh, is uh, better employment numbers, if you believe them, is a stronger dollar, is energy independence. We're certainly the giant among midgets on the world stage in terms of the robustness of our uh, economy and productivity, et cetera. That makes it a fascinating operating environment. Uh, I do agree, Steve, there, there's tons to do. Stressed is a very interesting area for us as well with high single digit to low double digit type opportunities. Um, and then if they're stabilized, the ready and available uh, availability, and nobody likes to use the word, and, and we're certainly a leverage loather, uh, but using appropriate leverage uh, on stabilized performing assets when you're able to source them either in the primary or secondary market in attractive ways uh, is interesting and, and produces real terrific value uh, and yield for our investors, and we're focused on that. Um, Richard, to your point about uh, when are we going to see the tensions in municipalities? Cat's out of the bag, shows on the road. Uh, you, you've now seen uh, a dozen to two dozen municipalities uh, in distress. Chapter nine is finding its footing much like chapter 11 did back in the 80s or something like that. Uh, so you're seeing chapter nines percolate. You are seeing some legal precedent take shape. Uh, it's not all bad. Jefferson County had some good precedent, uh, but you'll, you'll see it unfold in the next uh, period of time. So, you know, back to uh, predictions. I mean, over the next 
five to ten years, how many major bankruptcies would you expect to see? Uh, is this my Meredith Whitney moment? Yes. Uh, <laughs> pass. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think Chapter <clears throat> 9 will, will find its place uh, and uh, you'll see municipalities struggling to determine what's core and what's necessary in terms of services to offer their community uh, and private capital address itself to infrastructure and housing and health care needs in the communities. Okay, great. So uh, last theme I'd like to turn to is the uh, theme of liquidity in, in, in the markets. Um, this panel is engaged both in terms of acquiring assets and selling assets, so they see um, the liquidity that's available on the particular instruments that they, they seek to, to purchase and sell, but also maybe the beneficiaries of uh, illiquidity that's, that's developing in the markets over time. And so that, this is a theme I think it's going to be discussed in a number of panels, was already discussed earlier this morning. I was wondering if, if, if individuals wanted to share their experiences first, just, just to make it concrete. In what sense do you, has the market become less liquid if that's, if that's been your experience than it was in, in, pre-crisis? Maybe Steve? Sure. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a new phenomenon. This is, this is several years in the making. Uh, there's no question. Look, liquidity is a function of the market you're in. So we're in a relatively good market right now. There's some liquidity, but that changes very quickly. There's no question the broker-dealers are committing less capital. And what that means is that when there are movements, they're much more violent. Um, you're going to get, in my view, is you're going to get to the right value one way or the other. It's just happening much more quickly and with much less friction. So a broker-dealer who is mandate is, you know, he's got a seller of, of 10 million bonds. You know, the, it's now going out and trying to find a buyer, whereas five or 10 years ago, they might have taken those down themselves, traded, and it would have been a much more dampened move down. It doesn't mean, again, you're, you're going to get to the right level of value. Um, but it just happens a lot more quickly. And, you know, liquidity is, I think it might have been Howard Marks in his last letter talked about liquidity. You know, people think of liquidity as how quickly can I sell something if I need to. Uh, liquidity, if you were, were a mutual fund that had a lot of oil and gas exposure in October and November and you wanted out, liquidity was not good. If you have dedicated capital and you're a buyer of those assets, liquidity was fantastic. Uh, you could sort of name your price and, and get a lot of bonds. And so we have, we have set up, um, we're working on our second private equity distressed vehicle now. We, we had one in 2010. We're in the tail end of raising our second one now, specifically to have capital available for when those periods of volatility happen in the market. And our view is we're going to see more, much more, not less volatility going forward. And you want to just be prepared for that with, with dedicated capital. Brian? Yeah, we, we see the, uh, the trades down from the 2007 le seven level of a million dollars per trade to $500,000 per trade. We see, obviously, we see the illiquidity in the markets there. And, um, and so it's, once you get into a name, you may want to have a longer holding period uh, view of the, of the name. And then it, also in the middle market, I talked about the uh, BDCs having less capital. And um, so we, we're going to see um, some nice price uh, increases there in that middle market. And Chris, uh, maybe you could share your experience, but I would also suggest uh, you focus, if you can, on, on the distinction between idiosyncratic illiquidity, you know, a specific name, is a set of bonds you want to buy, which it sounds like clearly uh, there's a liquidity issue there. And, but also, what does it mean for fixed income market in general? Is, is there a chance of, a, of, of a, a market move greater in this environment, or is that really a different issue? No, I mean, I think it's, it's a similar issue. Um, you know, the, I, actually do, I actually do think liquidity is a function of, of price. If you're willing to sell at where the market's bidding you, you have liquidity. Um, I think the problem in, you know, in, in the, let's just call it, you know, um, non-investment grade, because that's the market that I deal in, um, the problem in the non-investment grade market is the, the mutual fund or CLO managers think liquidity is getting a bid at the price that I paid or the price that I'm marked. And that's obviously preposterous. So I think, you know, as Steve said, you know, things will find their price. It's happening quicker now because of, um, you know, the lack of dealer, you know, positioning. And I think that speaks to, you know, overall flows, you know, inflows, outflows. So if you start to see some, some moves down and we, you know, we had really just touched on it with energy. Um, but I think if there's any period of, of 
extended outflows in, in high yield mutual funds, you could start to see some real problems. There's, there's not enough distressed buyers, I don't think, to, to, in, to pick up you know, those outflows. It's going to be a major problem. I, uh, having said that, I don't think a quarter point rise in interest rates is going to force people into treasuries. Um, and fr frankly, short term is really the only impact that the Fed can, 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 um, you know, has on the market. I, I think longer term rates are not going to move. So you know, people may stay in high yield bonds for a long time. You know, so I don't, I don't see the problem as tomorrow's issue, but it certainly, it will be a problem as that capital flows into, you know, into other areas. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm very distant from it, have never traded myself. I, I've always been a little surprised that people thought the banks were providing some great uh, source of cushion against uh, market selling pressure. I, 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 I maybe reading too much into this one study put out by some people at the Federal Reserve that tracked uh, dealer inventory behavior around major uh, financial uh, distress over the last 10, 20 years where they looked at 10-week periods of, of the gross positions of dealers around uh, each of these dates. And uh, all those dates of distress were the dates in which the dealers uh, were cutting their positions uh, more uh, than they had at any other points in history, and that, that suggested they were the first out the door, not uh, you know helping people on their way out. Now, in that data included a period in which they had both prop desks and, yeah. and dealing activity, and the two were blended in the data. Yeah. And uh, so the role of the the dealer in terms of placing an individual bond issue, you know that that's really what we're talking about at the idiosyncratic level when it comes to reacting to what might be a fundamental move, then you're really talking about the prop desk activity. It's hard to define, of course, but uh, not, not clear to me that the, the prop desk was your friend in, in, those, in those situations. That's what I would put out there as an alternative view. Um, but with that, uh, Lawrence, you may want to comment on this general issue or, or what you're seeing in the muni market, which may have a different dynamic, I don't know, or the same. Uh, similar, exacerbated, if anything, in, in munis, you have a decentralized, really a, a network that relies on regional and local broker dealers, and the regulatory environment and other capital constraints at the moment uh, have really tightened uh, that market such that bid asks, bid ask gaps are wider. Um, certainly, the view that we will see gap type moves more frequently uh, resulting from that and other conditions is, is one we share. Um, and I think the, it also presents an opportunity where uh, you can be something of a back dealer to the street when, when those, um, those uh, situations present themselves. As it relates to deeply distressed credits, uh, we've just never thought that that was much of a liquid market anyway. Right. Um, it's only in the frothiest of times that everybody has capital to address every situation. Um, and so there's, there's other things you can do around that as well. Uh, interesting times out there. I do think um, regulation and other uh, Basel and other influences on uh, how money center banks and regional dealers are dealing with capital uh, has had impact, uh, at least on our markets, as, as I'm able to observe them. Right. We have time for a few questions, if there's anyone. Right here, gentlemen. Uh, we'll repeat your question, so shout it out. Repeat the question. The question here is, um, should Puerto Rico be allowed to file for Chapter 9 uh, in light of the fact that that could be a moral hazard or a bad public policy given other states' interest in perhaps doing the same? Um, complicated question goes back to uh, giving power to the states uh, as a framework uh, of our government. Uh, here we have a. Uh, territory, the island of Puerto Rico, that really, and this encompasses the question of what is it? Uh, is it a state? Is it a protected territory? Uh, how does it uh, interact with uh, Washington, D.C. and the federal government generally? I'll, I'll say a few things. Uh, number one, 
I'm not sure we back the idea, nor there, is, there, there isn't a big movement to allow Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth, to qualify for uh, Chapter 9. It's that the government-owned cor corporations could be dealt with uh, in a Chapter 9 uh, uh, bankruptcy. The second thing I'll say is the alternative is so heinous. The alternative of different groups of creditors seeking different venues and having different results is chaotic. Um, so this is a special circumstance. Uh, and it is our construct that led to this problem. Puerto Rico's triple tax exempt, meaning th those who hold Puerto Rico paper, as many of you know, could claim exemption in the state of Missouri or Louisiana or Florida or New York. That led to huge borrowings, and we have this huge problem on our hands, so we do have to address it in some cohesive way. It's a special uh, circumstance. Um, in, the, in the sovereign universe, which I follow, many everyone follows, uh, it's not uncommon for sovereigns to just stop paying. And then their debts get resolved through negotiation with their creditors. No bankruptcy, no resort to judges. I mean, there may be afterwards, if maybe for 20 years, pursuing Argentina in the courts. But, but uh, you know, there is something uh, that can happen in the absence of a, of a clear legal framework. But it's chaotic. Uh, and in a situation where you're part of a country, uh, the politicians involved don't really want to be the one mm -hmm. to have broken with the norms and expectations. So I think it's less likely that you, that you, that you get that type of behavior. But sometimes there's just no money to be paid. And a number of states defaulted um, in the Great Depression. Um, and they didn't have the money. They didn't pay. Uh, now they ultimately paid decade years later. But uh, that, that kind of situation could happen in Puerto Rico. Um, any other question? Yes. Sure. Um, there, there's been a theme uh, on some of the uh, comments that this time is different. So if the leverage is at the high end and the business cycle is eight years plus, is it that people are expecting the business cycle to be unusually long this time, where two years or three years time um, you're not going to get um, what, what's happened the last uh, couple cycles, or is it that the leverage um, is, um, you know, uh, on, on this time where previously it <coughs> seemed to be pro problematic, that's not going to be the case this time? Uh, I, I, th I think I understand your question. So um, I would say essentially we had a correction in 2008 in the market. Um, it, we didn't really have a a flushing of, of debt, though. So it's been extended, but it's been extended because of the amount of liquidity that's been put into the overall market. And I think that's really just been forced liquidity by you know, the Fed you know, buying you know, AAA assets and then those getting too tight, and people just kind of keep pushing out further and further on the, on the risk spectrum. So the, the, I think the, the answer, if that was the, the reason you know, why we're seeing what we're seeing, then that liquidity to come out of the market, so redemptions from those funds going into other asset classes and n not being available for companies to you know, pay the next interest payment or you know, drill the next you know, well that they want to drill. So that drying up of that liquidity will, will be the unwinding you know, of, you know, of the cycle. But it's not going to be, at least in the next couple of years, because you know, a massive amount of defaults because you know, the companies aren't, aren't able to you know, pay their debts, because they, they can just issue other debt and get the liquidity the way the market is currently. Did anyone on the panel want to speak about the term structure, inversion of the term structure being a requirement? I thought someone in our pre-meeting had discussed that. No. Yeah, the, the um, if you there's a slide on uh, the inversion um, that, that you can pull up, um, and every recession has been um, preceded in the last 50 years by a two percent inverted yield curve, and um, and so uh, if you if you look back um, over time, the last eight recessions have been preceded by a two percent, and it usually is uh, advanced by a year or so. So you can see the, you know, 70, 75, 80, 82, 91, 2001, 2008. 
Uh, currently, um, we're ch we have a 2% positive yield curve, and so the, the Fed would have to raise the rates by over 300 basis points to even get there, which uh, is not expected until 2017. You got another 12 months on top of that, so I think we're good into 2018. So uh, wow, low and long, and and, and the long-term rate will probably rise and further. Exactly. So you have to raise it even more. I mean, we are at the very beginning of a uh, interest rate inc rising part of the cycle, and it's occurring in a period of of deflation almost. So it's so different from other other cycles. Now it doesn't mean we won't be surprised. But uh, in terms well, I mean, of measuring the cycle. We don't know what's going to happen. That's yeah. the problem. The, yeah. the, the, the manipulation in the first place was so vast, you know, from what the Fed took, you know, zero to interest rates and then the amount of quantitative easing right. that who knows how that's going to unwind. We don't have any historical. Right. But at the same time, inflation has been extraordinarily low. So the, the low interest rate policy could be justified based on sure. the macroeconomic circumstances. Well, I think that's all we have time for now. And thank you very much. Oops. Thank my panelists. Thanks very much.